1984, Brother Cates gave me an assignment to start teaching the subject, the biblical subject of the Holy Spirit. We've been privileged to do that every year since to the second year of class in the last quarter. It's a wonderful study, I think. But I also recognize the fact that this subject is mistaught in every other religious circle besides the Church of Christ. And even in the church, it's mistaught, I believe. I thought it would be good this morning to take a look at the nature of the Holy Spirit and include in that some thoughts about the all-sufficiency of the Word of God. And I would invite your attention to this passage in John, the 14th chapter. We'll especially start with verse 16. You remember that John chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16 are the record of a conversation that Jesus had with 11 men when they were eating the preparation meal for the Passover. And in this meeting, he had to tell them that he would have to leave them, which troubled them greatly. He started out the conversation that's recorded in this chapter with, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And then he ended by saying, where I am, you may be also. He's going to come again and bring them to himself. Well, what were they to do meanwhile? He gave them instruction in that area also. If you will look very carefully at verse 25 in John 14, you'll find out to whom he said the things we're about to read, and none other. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. And so whatever he says here has to do with something that's going to help these men carry on after he leaves. And the first thing he says to them is, I will pray the Father, and he will send you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. As long as they needed him, this another comforter would be with them. Who is the another comforter? Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him. wonder how they knew him, since they hadn't met him yet. For he dwelleth with you. How did he dwell with them if the Lord had to send him from heaven to them? What's he mean when he says that? And shall be in you. Wonder what that means. And then he says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. How can he come if he goes away? He said he had to go away. And I'm going to send you another comforter. He's going to come back too? No, that's not what he means. It would be good for us, first of all, to, comp to uh, focus on the word another. In the New Testament, there are two Greek words translated another. One is alos, A-L-L-O-S. The other is heteros, H-E-T-E-R-O-U-S. This word here is alos. Heteros means another of the different kind, not the word he used here. He didn't say, I'm going to send you someone different from me totally. I'm going to send you a lost comforter, someone just like me. Of course he's just like Jesus. He's the third person of the Godhead. Jesus happens to be the second person of the Godhead in flesh, and the Father is the first person of the Godhead. I'm going to send you a comforter just like me. And that's how they'll know him. Because whatever he teaches, Jesus would teach. Whatever Jesus would teach, he would teach. So there'll be no difference in the guiding when the Holy Spirit comes to them to guide them. They're going to hear the same things from the Holy Spirit that Jesus taught. In fact, they're going to be reminded of what he taught, verse 26 of John 14. He's going to remind them of what he taught them, what Jesus taught them. 
but he's another comforter. Now, I want to comment on that for a moment. That word comforter is parakletos. The one called beside. Para beside, kletos, to call. The one called beside. The comforter here is for the apostles only. The comforter here is not my parakletos. Brother Sweeney in his book, The Spirit and the Word, spends a whole chapter showing that the term comforter as used here is never used with average Christians. It's always something that was done for the apostles. So whatever relationship they had with this comforter, I do not have. Why? Because I have a comforter. Would you open your Bible to 1 John 2, 1 and 2, please? My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate, parakletos. We have a comforter. His name is Jesus, not the Holy Spirit. This is misunderstood by so many folks today who exalt the Holy Spirit over the Christ. And yet, the Christ is our comforter. Keith Mosier is a member of the Church of Christ, not the Church of the Holy Spirit. We serve the Master whose attention was brought to us by these apostles who were guided completely into all truth by this comforter, John 16, 13, and I want to look at that in just a moment. Now, why would he send the Holy Spirit to them and not literally come back himself? Let's look at John 16, 7. He says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come. Notice that. The parakletos for the apostles won't come. If Jesus is there, wouldn't be any need. God's divine economy would have been violated here had the two of them been together doing the same thing. And so it's expedient. But why was it expedient? Jesus is in a body, folks. He can't follow these apostles all over the world while he's in that body. But the Holy Spirit can, not being in a body. The Holy Spirit can be everywhere, Psalm 139. Wherever the apostles go, he can guide them in whatever state, village, country, town, whatever it is. And so it was expedient for him, for them, that he go away. And when he comes... He will do something for them. Let's go back to John 14 for just a moment. I'm going to pray the Father and send you a comforter whose essence is just like me. He's deity too. Even the Spirit of truth, now watch what he says, whom the world cannot lombano. What an interesting term here. It means to grab by force. to Take a hold of. Well, the world can't take a hold of the Holy Spirit. That should have been comforted, comforting to people who just heard that they were going to take care, hold of Jesus and take him away from them. But the world can't take this one away because it can't see him. That's what he just says next. Neither knoweth him and can't see him. He's a spirit. And so the world can't crucify this one. That should have been comforting to these who were knowing their leader was leaving. But when he went away, another comforter would come, another parakletos would come. He is the parakletos only to the apostles in this special way. Now look with me at John 16, 13. When we read in the King James Version, Holy Ghost, that gives people the idea that the Spirit sort of floats around. But the word ghost in 1611 didn't mean an apparition the way it does now in English. It meant a guest. You could actually read that, the holy guest, the one who came to the apostles, invited into their lives by the Father himself. He was the holy guest. But I hear folks talk about Holy Ghost religion and all kinds of strange things that are made up about the Holy Spirit. 
but he is the comforter for the apostles in a very special way. Let's read now in John 16, 13. Albeit when he, when he, not it, the first question I ever had at an open forum on the Holy Spirit was, who is the Holy Spirit and how does it operate? I said, that's a great question. Let's comment on the word it. He is not an it. This is the third person of the Godhead, a being, one being. And the revelator says that right at the moment, he is in heaven. He's the seven spirits around the throne pictured in Revelation. He's not here anymore. He is literally in heaven now. But when he came to the apostles, what would he do? When he, the spirit of the truth, has come, he will guide you. He will guide you into all truth. Did he do that? The apostle Peter, one of those led by the Holy Spirit into all truth, wrote that God had given them all things pertaining to life and godliness. 2 Peter 1.3 And Paul said, we have this treasure in earth and vessels. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. If you met an apostle in those days, you'd meet a walking New Testament. They had all the truth in an earthen vessel in those days. Why? They were being guided into it by the Holy Spirit. Now watch this very carefully. He shall not speak of himself. What is it that the Holy Spirit in guiding the apostles could not do? Speak of himself. He was not allowed to exalt himself over the Christ. His mission was to come and teach these men about Jesus, not about himself. He shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Look at verse 14. He shall glorify me. He, the Holy Spirit himself, will glorify the Christ and shall show it, receive a mind and show it unto you. Any teacher, group, school, whatever it is, that exalts the Holy Spirit over the Christ is automatically a false teacher, false group, false group, false religion. He can't do that. The Holy Spirit himself was not allowed to do that. In fact, if you'll close your Bibles for a moment, I'll give you a little test. Now, I don't want you to use a Bible verse in thinking about what I'm going to say to you. No Bible verses allowed. Now tell me what you know about the Holy Spirit. Nothing. And that's the point. We need to learn what his job was. He's a being. He's not just floating around in space. He's an actual being. He has a mind. God knows what is the mind of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. He has a will. Acts 16. He loves. Acts 15, 30. He speaks. 1 Timothy 3, 1 and 2. This is a being, folks, who was to come and teach these men how to exalt the Christ and how to put him first in everything. Let's go back now to 2 Peter 1, 3. I was sitting with a couple way back in the 1960s. And the sisters in Christ said to me, you mean all we have is the Bible? Yes. That's a wonderful gift from God. She wanted something more than the Word. She wanted a feeling, an operation, a movement, some kind of dynamo, so that she didn't have to do it herself. 
And so she was not satisfied just having God's word. It wasn't enough for her. They eventually left the church, both of them. But Peter said, before he ever wrote it down, that God had given the apostles all things that pertain to life and godliness. That's why the Hebrews writer said, Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is living and active. I think the King James says quick and powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. It's the greatest surgeon ever given to man. It knows exactly where to cut, how deep to cut, and where to stop. Piercing into the dividing of the center of the soul and the spirit, the joint and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Have you ever experienced the the thought that that preacher got that lesson up just for me? (laughs) Ever gone through that kind of thing? Uh, I don't know any preacher that smart, but the word is... And when he preaches the word, then it gets to us. I told someone one day, every time Mark Reynolds preached, I wanted to come forward. You ever have that feeling, the way he preached to us? He got my toes all stepped on. He said he was reaching my heart, though, is what he was trying to do. We have a message here that is so powerful that Isaiah said about his writings and others of his time, to the law and to the testimony, If they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. He meant dawn light. That's the word he used, Isaiah 20. This book, this message, is not just ink on paper. It's special, and it's written in a special way with a special force in it. And the Holy Spirit uses this message to reach me. Let's look first at Romans 10, 17 together. In discussing the fact that the law of Moses did not bring justification, Paul concluded something here. He said, so then faith, the gospel system, cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. I looked up the term word there and I got amazed. Because I knew there was a Greek word logos, in the beginning was the word, the logos. But that's not the word here in the Greek. It's R-A-M-A here. Chrema. Oh, the chrema is the power of God that brings faith. Why did he use the word chrema? The rhema of Christ. The New Testament message of Christ has some kind of power in it. What is that? Well, I went over to Ephesians 6, 17. And I read, take the helmet of salvation and the word of, and the sword of the spirit, which is the chrema of God, the word of God. And I thought, oh, I got it. Because rhema means the breathed word. When the Holy Spirit's word is preached, it's activated with the same breath that was used to make that dust into a living being. That's the same power in this message that was in the creation of man himself. And when this message is preached, it has the power of God's breath in it. That's why Paul wrote, all scripture is God-breathed. Inspired of God, the King James has, literally breathed of God. What a message. It's all sufficient. I don't need any more then. And once I have discovered that the Word of God is sufficient, I don't ask for more. Look at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 now. All Scripture is given by God's breath. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Watch now. Watch, watch. That the man of God may be complete. If I'm complete through the Word, I don't need any more. I don't ask for any more. I'm truly furnished unto every good work. And that word's truly there, incidentally, because he translated a word through and through. Everything I need for life and godliness is the Holy Spirit's message given to those inspired men whom he led, whom he was, for whom he was the paraclete, for, him, for whom he was the comforter. Do 
years ago, my friend James Meadows wrote a workbook on the Holy Spirit, and he made a comment in the workbook, something like this, that this is the least studied, least understood being of the Godhead. I believe that's right. We listen to denominational preachers and people and those kinds of folks teach. We even drive by a tent that says Holy Spirit meeting 8.30 tonight. Have we ever stopped and asked ourselves how did they know the Holy Spirit was going to show up there at 8.30? Do we really believe He is when He's in heaven? The third person of the Godhead. The day I was baptized, the fellow who immersed me said, I now baptize you into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I knew exactly when my relationship began with all three. And my relationship began with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit the same way. Exactly the same way in each case. But if we buy into denominational teaching, we'll think there's something special for us. And we make him our comforter when he never was going to be that at all. The parakletos for the Christian is Jesus the Christ. John, 1 John 2, 1 and 2. Let's look at John 3, 3 through 5 now as we offer the invitation this morning. In a conversation with a fellow named Nicodemus, an ecclesiastical leader of his day, a doctor in Israel, Jesus said, you must be born again. That fellow got confused, Nicodemus did. And rather than thinking spiritually, he thought physically. He said, how can I be born again? Can I enter the second time into my mother's womb and be born again? In verse 8 of John 3, Jesus will reference the fact that you can't see this birth. It's a spiritual rebirth, not a physical one. And so Nicodemus missed the point altogether. Then Jesus repeated it. You must be born of water and of the Spirit. Two elements necessary for birth. In physical birth, there are two persons necessary. In spiritual birth, there are two involved. The Word and the teachings of the Holy Spirit. And if I follow what the Holy Spirit taught me, and I enter that water according to His teachings for the reason He told me to enter it, I will receive salvation. And so I need to find out what the Holy Spirit said about this water. It has to do with the water of baptism, John, uh, Acts 8, beginning at verse 33. And when Philip had done preaching to a fellow about Jesus, he said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And so I need to get myself immersed. Someone needs to do that for me. Because the Holy Spirit said, I need to be born of the water, according to his teachings. And Jesus said that the Holy Spirit was just like him. And if I hear him and hear the Holy Spirit, I'll hear the same teaching. So whatever the Holy Spirit taught, Christ taught. That's why Christ said, he that believed and is immersed shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. We have a message that is the Word, and that Word is the seed of the kingdom of God. I was talking to a brother uh, one time about this, and he said, well, I know the Word is the seed, but you have to water the seed. So the Holy Spirit has to do something better and different for me besides just hear the message. No. I took him to the book of Isaiah and listened to Isaiah tell us that the seed had the moisture in it of its own. 
This is a watered word already, a breathed word, an all-sufficient word, a magnificent message given to men under the direction of the Holy Spirit, who when he was through with his task, went back to heaven, and left us a message to guide us until we get to heaven ourselves. We have a teaching to be baptized for remission of sins. We have a teaching that when we sin, we should pray and ask God to forgive us. Those messages all came under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Will you listen to it this morning while we stand and while we sing? Well,